Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have attention, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go to um, episode number two. Um, so you should have this in front of you. Um, that's on page one of the handout. This is episode number two, Eyes on the Prize. And um, this episode, I'll give you notes for, for this one as well. And then, um, then you need to go and watch that episode as well. It's on YouTube. I'll give you the link. Um, this one is very fascinating. Um, it's called Fighting Back, and it focuses the attention on the civil rights movement, particularly in the area of education, um, where great efforts are going to be made to integrate or desegregate uh, the segregated schools um, that had existed in this country, elementary, secondary, collegiate. Um, and uh, yeah, didn't that get thrown out? Wasn't that found unconstitutional in violation of 14th, 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause in the uh, uh, 1956 case, Brown versus Board of Education? If you're thinking, yeah, it did. So what's the deal? What's the problem? Well, we're gonna look very closely at how all this played out. Um, so let's get started. Okay, you guys ready? All right, here we go. So just a reminder, there's, oh, sorry, 1954 case. 1954, unanimous Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, um, says that uh, we're going to have integrated schools. And as you know already, there's going to be massive, massive resistance to that. Uh, we saw that the, uh, the courts uh, helped play a key role last time in helping Martin Luther King Jr. and um, Rosa Parks and others win um, support in uh, stopping bus seg segregation in the city of Montgomery. And those court cases are gonna be very, very, very important as we continue on through here. But boy, howdy. This is a tough, tough political issue and politics are gonna play a huge, huge role in this because a lot of the folks in the deep south, particularly in the white community, um, are not real excited about getting rid of segregation. They feel as though segregation is what is needed. It is there and this is what we gotta do. Um, and to have integration, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's strange to just think of this, that um, there were some parents, um, some, some of the white parents, it felt like if their, um, you know, white kids, white daughters particularly, went to uh, school and the same as uh, black kids, black boys that terrible terrible things were going to happen you'd have miscegenation you'd have mongrels and so forth being born it's like oh my gosh anyway these are big 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 um attitudes racist attitudes yeah um but it's not going to stop key african americans and their supporters and in, in, in the white community of the united states um to try and get some real changes um, one of the first efforts, this is going to be very interesting, 1956, um, following on the heels of the Brown versus Board of Education case, author and Lucy, um, African-American, young woman, she wanted to attend the University of Alabama, and um, you know, which had been segregated, um, only available to whites. I mean, if you're African-American living in the United States, particularly in the South, your um, post-secondary, you know, collegiate opportunities were pretty much limited to small African-American colleges. Um, that was pretty much where you could go. And the University of Alabama was not available. But she won a court order to um, allow her to go to the University of Alabama. There you see Thurgood Marshall, her NAACP attorney. And so she's showing up to go to the University of Alabama. Well, the folks that run the University of Alabama don't like that. And they want to keep her out. And so an interesting strategy comes up for the segregationists. They say, well, it's not safe for her to attend college because there's these dangerous racists and they're going to hurt her. And gosh, we can't do anything about it. And so the solution is to keep her out. And that's what they did. They didn't let her in. It's kind of like, you know, the heckler's veto, the rioter's veto. Um, and the fact that they were able to be successful in keeping her from actually attending school um, is going to be an encouragement to segregationists 
who don't want to have integration. And they will use the threat of violence as a way of showing that, uh, well, you can't go to this school, you can't go to these universities because it's not safe for you and therefore we're looking out for your safety and so therefore stay away. Is that how it's going to play out? Well, as we go through the notes on this, we're, we're going to see that there's going to be some pretty, pretty interesting um, circumstances as it plays through. Now, you're going to have the court fights going on here. There's Thurgood Marshall again with the NAACP, and they're going to be filing cases left and right and center. And you're going to have, I mean, if you've got people that are, that are going to actually like um, try and stick up for the Constitution, stick up for the rights of African Americans to attend uh, education, get those opportunities. Um, it's not going to be safe. And there are threats, there's violence. Yeah, you could win some court cases. You can win um, support from the United States Supreme Court. But what's that going to mean if somebody blows um, up your house while you're sleeping in it? Um, will there be political support? And the key question here is, Will there be political support on the part of people who are in charge of law enforcement and military security to provide the kind of security that is necessary to make sure that African Americans who are allowed to attend these schools can attend so safely? Will there be political support? Well, this whole question of are they moving too slow, are they moving too fast, and so forth, this is the question that is present when Dwight D. Eisenhower, Republican president Dwight D. Eisenhower, comes into office. And he's going to be dealing with this phase, this uh, initial phase of the civil rights movement. Um, and of course, he's in charge of national security. And, um, and he's in charge of in, in, uh, enforcing the United States Constitution. And, um, you know, he gets advisors that are basically saying, hey, you know, let's try and uh, keep things from getting too, you know, too crazy, don't move too fast, and so forth. We want to avoid violence. Uh, we want to make, you know, change uh, gradually. Um, remember the Supreme Court, they said, you know, that the public schools in the South and so forth were not going to be integrated instantaneously, but with all deliberate speed. So, Initially, Eisenhower's like, okay, let's just try and do this bit by bit by bit by bit. And he has some encouragement because some of the southern states are not as rock hard racist um, and segregationist as others. Um, in one state in particular, in uh, Arkansas, um, the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, the school board there in uh, about for the uh, school year beginning September 1957, the school board decided to have some integration, okay? So they're gonna integrate their schools for the very first time, but they're gonna do it slowly, okay? They're not gonna integrate all the schools all at once. They're gonna try it out for a little bit, okay? Um, they're going to have just some select African-American students, high school students, attend one of the high schools, and that is Central High School. Okay, so that was a decision by the Little Rock, um, Arkansas School Board. Okay, well, the governor of the state of Arkansas wasn't really that excited about integration. You can see here he is, Orville Faubus, um, and he is against the integration of schools within the Little Rock School District <laughs> in Central High or any of them. And he's speaking on behalf of the um, of a lot of the voters in the state of Arkansas who aren't really that excited about integration. Of course, when you're thinking who are the voters, well, there's you know about 30 of the population is African-American, but they're not voting for the most part. Uh, many of them are prevented from being in a position to vote. And so Orville Faubus is playing to the popular whims of segregationists in the state of Arkansas. And that is going to be a very important point as we look at the story of how things played out in 1957 and 1958 in Little Rock, Arkansas at Central High School. One thing I want you to keep an eye on as we go through these, and that is, you see the D there and we've got the R for, for Eisenhower. Um, the Republican Democratic Party is like today, very big, very popular, and very close as far as support across the country. Um, but an interesting thing, at this time in the South, 
there wasn't much of a Republican Party at all in the Southern states. In fact, if you think back to the United States Civil War, um, it was Republican Abraham Lincoln, who was the winning president, um, who defeated the South. And for many, many years, there was just no such thing as Republicans hardly at all in the deep, deep South. So the Democratic Party at that time was the most popular party. And so the governors that we're going to be looking at um, as we go through this unit, um, time and time again, they're going to be Democratic governors. And um, they're going to be, you know, running into the headwinds of what's going on nationally. What is uh, the point of view of uh, the United States of America, people living in the Northeast, in the Midwest, and in the West? Do they see things the same as the South? Well, increasingly, there's going to be some difference. And there's going to be some conflict between Democratic governors in the South and ultimately Democratic presidents like John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. But anyway, we've got this issue here. So don't be surprised when you see this because there's going to be some changes going on by the time we get through this. Democrats in the early stages here, segregationists for the most part, white and in the South. And there's Orwell Faubus. And he is not excited about having African Americans in 10th school in Little Rock, Arkansas. So first day of school, um, the nine, the Little Rock nine, here they are, um, Central High School. Uh, we've got, what do we get, 10 people here. This lady right here, older lady, is, I think, hosting these uh, young African Americans. And they're all, they, they range. I think the oldest is Ernest Green right here. Pretty sure that's him. Yep. And he is going to be a senior, and the others are, you know, juniors, sophomores, and so forth. Um, and, you know, they're all dressed up, getting ready. They've been trained. They are like, you know, they know they're going to get into some pushback from some of the students who aren't that excited to, to have them there. Although there are going to be other students that are going to be like, whatever, they're just like students and maybe we can deal with this. You'll see this uh, in the film. Um, some of them are going to be in opposition, others are going to be fine. Uh, but here we go. There's the nine. What did Or Orville Faubus do their first day of school? Did he stand in front of the door and say, hey, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Now, Orville Faubus is the, uh, the top executive for the state of Arkansas. Now listen carefully, make sure you have this in there. Um, throughout the country, governors are in charge of local military militia groups, National Guard units. Write it down. Orville Faubus ordered the National Guard to prevent these nine African-American students, the Little Rock Nine, from attending Central High School on that day. And it was in violation of the federal court order that they be allowed to attend. And I mean, it's like, so like, can anyone step in? Let me see, is there somebody who has authority over a state's National Guard unit? Because those National Guard units are actually part of the United States military. Think about it, right here. He's in charge of the Arkansas National Guard. Can anyone trump him? Can anyone over, override him? The president can. Will the president in this instance override Governor Faubus? Well, let's see how it plays out. Because on that very first day, you have massive crowds there, not so much there to support the arrival of these African-American students. A lot of the crowds are there jeering and, and, uh, and threatening the African-American students. In fact, it was really, really sad. You'll see this in the film. Uh, one of the gals um, got there a little bit late. I think maybe her alarm didn't go off. She didn't show up at the exact same time. So as eight of them showed up and they get turned around, one of them shows up and she's unaccompanied by anyone. And this is one of the ugliest scenes in the whole first day of, of the Central High School school day. There she is, Elizabeth Eckford trying to make her way, oh, into the school? No, they won't allow you, the National Guard's there. And meanwhile, you got these people around her just screaming at her face and saying all kinds of nasty racial epithets and so forth. Just nasty, it's like, oh, we just hate you, hate you, hate you for trying to integrate what had previously been a fully segregated high school. So what's the NAACP going to do? What's Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP attorneys going to do? Well, they're going to go to court, right? And they're going to get a court order basically saying that the governor is unlawful in preventing 
uh, African Americans from attending the school because that was a decision by the uh, the local school board, and it follows the United States Supreme Court decision. Um, so what's going to happen then? <laughs> so, so the next time the kids show up for school, um, <clears throat> the National Guard's not there. <coughs> Who's in charge of providing security for these uh, kids? Uh, because the big mass nasty uh, uh, crowds are there. Um, local law enforcement, Little Rock police, try to provide some means of enforcement, but it's not good and it's nasty. I mean, there's some African American reporters that are like reporting on the scene of what's going on there, and they get beat up by vicious elements within the uh, within the crowd. I mean, this is just nuts. This is nuts going on going on here. Is that intimidation going to work? I mean, it kept Arthur and Lucy, Lucy out of um, University of Alabama. Governor's not going to send in the National Guard to provide protection. He didn't want to. Local law enforcement, city police, they're not sufficient. Can anyone do that? Can anyone provide law enforcement? Can anyone provide some security for these nine students so that they can attend school? Ike. Ike can do it. Ike looks and he's like, I was a general. I was in charge of the Allied Forces at D-Day. Um, orders need to be followed. We need to be fair. Ike is going to do absolutely, totally the right thing in this situation. What does Ike do? What does he have it as a result? Now, he could order the National Guard to actually provide protection, but he does something actually quite interesting. He takes a regular part of the United States military, the 101st Airborne Division of the United States Army, a highly decorated unit that fought in many different campaigns, including World War II, and they're later going to go on and serve with distinction in, World, in the Vietnam War. And he's gonna order those guys in full uniform with bayonets <laughs> to make sure that the crazy crowd does not harm. So they're gonna get like, you know, protection. They're gonna get an escort from their, the, the home that they gather in the morning to the school. They're gonna be dropped off at the school. Each of the nine kids is gonna have a personal escort as they go from class to class to class. Of course, they can't go into the girls' bathroom, but nevertheless, these guys are gonna be there providing protection, what, for a week, a month? All year long. The 101st Airborne is gonna be there. The president steps in to make sure that integration is done and that it is done safely. And you're going to see in the film all the various different methods of harassment and so forth. Some people are going to be jerks all the way through the year. Others, other students, other white students are going to be like, uh, you know what, I kind of changed my mind about this whole thing and uh, these guys aren't so bad and what's the big deal and gosh, we don't need social distancing. like. Yeah, we can go to school together. Um, did the public opinion of the country, um, excuse me, uh, the state of Arkansas change much during that time period? Well, take a look. Here we have, there he is, Ernest Green. He managed to get through the entire year as a senior and graduate from Central High School, first African-American to graduate from Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And there you can see right there, the governor stepped in. Can they do that? He did. Governor Favas closed all public schools. Make sure you put that in your notes. That's an interesting little thing that uh, some of the governors of some of the states during this whole civil rights movement are going to do as one of their little mm, tools for stopping integration. They're like, well, if they're going to have African-American students going to our public schools uh, with the white kids and we don't want that, we're just going to shut the schools down altogether. And you're going to see at different times in different states in the 1950s to 60s, schools, public schools just shut down. And the parents are like, well, what are we going to do? And one of the things, it's a curious thing, they don't talk about it as much in the film, but make sure you write this down. And one of the things that happens is you get all these private schools popping up left, right, and center. And of course, if it's private, under the First Amendment private association, you can pick and choose who you want to be in your school. So you'll get all these white only private schools. Oh, and then they come to the, the legislature and they go, hey, we're paying all these taxes to the local schools, public schools and so forth, but our kids aren't going. 
So can we get some tax money back in the form of a rebate or some kind of a credit? Because we have to pay for tuition for our kids to go to these off-white private schools. Um, initially, the United States Supreme Court was like, mm, no, we see what you're up to and we're not going to allow tax credits for private schools. Because basically what you're really trying to do is get around the United States Constitution. So here we have it. Um, in 1958, 1959, public schools in the state of Arkansas shut down. And later, when uh, in some of the states where they did ultimately have integration, you just saw a massive flight in, for a while of white kids going to these new private schools. So here we go. You've got the federal courts helping out, but you've got political resistance and, and the part of local communities and states and um, and so forth. And you got rioting going on. I mean, like, give me a break. Here we go. Fall 1960, city of New Orleans, right? Four little black girls going to uh, public school, elementary school for the first time. Riots break out. You can't have little black girls going into school with, oh my gosh, what a mess. Okay, so Dwight D. Eisenhower, he finishes eight years who's gonna be the next president. Well, they have an election. November of 1960, very close election. The winner, John F. Kennedy, okay, Democrat from Massachusetts. And he gets a lot of support from, uh, you know, Democrats voting in various different parts of the country, including the Deep South. So he's got an interesting thing here. As we go forward with this, look particularly at how presidents, John F. Kennedy, Democrat, and then later Lyndon B. Johnson, Kennedy's vice president, who takes over after Kennedy shot and killed in 1963, how those presidents, those Democratic national leaders, tried to finagle the whole situation um, because they've got Democrat support in the Deep South. And how are they gonna do? Because, I mean, the civil rights movement is still moving forward. It is still moving forward. Let's take a look at the next big event. And this is gonna be covered as well in your, in your film that you're gonna be watching, episode two. So the attention now turns to the state of Mississippi, okay? State of Mississippi, along with Alabama, perhaps the two most, um, what word should I use? It's just segregationist of the two. I think it's fair to say. So here we go. Um, Ross Barnett, governor, Democrat, state of Mississippi, he's gonna be dealing with the situation involving um, college and the integration of college, specifically the University of Mississippi. There we go. James Meredith, right here, young African-American, wanted to attend the University of Mississippi, um, Ole Miss. And he's getting the assistance here, very important person, um, Medgar Evers, um, leading um, member of the Mississippi NAACP, and they're going to have to fight their case in court after court after court, and of course in public as well. And uh, he wants to, James Meredith wants to get continue his collegiate education or continue his education by going to college at the University of Mississippi. And so they're fighting, getting into court, and um, basically, um, once you start making your way up through the, the system, it, it, you know, your local federal judge might not go along with it, but by the time you get up to the Fifth Circuit, and certainly by the time you get up to the United States Supreme Court, yeah, it's kicked in there. You can't continue to segregate and ban African Americans from attending public universities like the University of Mississippi. So they get a ruling. He gets to um, enroll at the University of Mississippi. So what's going to happen? Is he going to get an opportunity to enroll? This is where you get people like this, Ross Barnett, you know, who is cheered on by heritage, Confederate loving uh, um, folks in the Deep South, uh, whites who are like cheering his every effort to stop Meredith from getting um, enrolled. And so, I mean, he'll show up at the registrar's office where Meredith is, is showing to, going to enroll for his classes, his fall classes. And he'll just, no, I'm going to do this and I'm going to stop this from happening. And I'm no, 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 no. So what are you going to have here, right? So, and of course, Barnett is like saying, well, there could be violence. Maybe we should wait a while. How about a month? And I don't know what could happen. 
to somebody's education, if you delay a month or two or three and they don't get education during that time, I mean, how long can you go? Think about that. How long can you go without attending school and actually having any real replacement? I mean, you get stuck. So basically, it's like, you know, they're just sort of playing, you know, delay the clock and hoping that they'll get a victory. Barnett and his folks will get a victory uh, preventing Meredith from showing up and actually being able to attend the University of Mississippi. It's like what happened in Alabama with Arthur and Lucy. But Meredith keeps trying. And Medgar Evers and the other and the rest of his team keep trying. And they're putting pressure on guess who to do something to make sure that James Meredith's constitutional rights as United States citizens are protected, that he receives protection and the opportunity to attend school. And the court orders are actually in, um, honored and enforced. Well, who are they gonna be putting, protect, putting some pressure on? He didn't wanna feel the pressure, but he's gonna feel it. I mean, Kennedy, <laughs> Kennedy's dealing with all kinds of different things. I mean, imagine this in the, in the fall of 19, 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis is going on, and Kennedy is like, I got to deal with like communism and nuclear missiles pointed at the United States, and this is going on, this is going on. Um, so I mean, he actually gets his his uh, brother, uh, his Attorney General um, Robert F. Kennedy, to play a lead role in what is going to be playing out in Mississippi. Um, ultimately, Kennedy sends in security. Not the 101st Airborne, and he doesn't call up the National Guard units for Mississippi either. He sends in U.S. Marshals and all kinds of other folks, you know, prison guards and, you know, federal prison guards and so forth, and here they are coming into uh, Oxford, Mississippi, where the, the campus of the University of Mississippi, and, um, and they're going to make sure that things are going to be safe when James Meredith comes to show up to register. Um, as you'll see in the film, it doesn't quite work out that way. I mean, Kennedy did step up, but man, oh man, it is going to be some ugly riding going on in the city of Oxford, Mississippi. And I tell you what, James Meredith doesn't put his face out there. You got, it's ugly. And there'll be people dead as a result of riding. But ultimately, the riots will be put down. Uh, September 30th, 1962, 400 to 500 U.S. Marshals coming in. Um, 35 Marshals were actually shot. What, people in Mississippi have guns in pickup trucks and all over the place. Two people were actually killed, uh, a reporter among, among them. Um, but finally, um, oh, oh, finally the army is brought in, and yeah, they restore order, and James Meredith is able to finally enroll. And uh, you'll watch this in the film. I remember there was this question that they, you know, this reporter was following James Meredith around Ole Miss, you know, as he's going to classes, and he asks him probably one of the most unfair questions you could think of, which is, don't you feel sort of responsible for the two people that died and all the injuries and the riots and so forth? And I'm like, yeah, is that James Meredith's fault? I don't think so. But nevertheless, he prevailed and he attended the University of Mississippi and um, he graduated from the University of Mississippi after completing his collegiate education there. Um, and it was a tough victory, but it was a victory. And the courts and the president, using the military, if necessary, could stand up and prevent a Southern governor, a segregationist, from barring African Americans from attending school. It's not going to be easy from here on out, but this is the conclusion of the first. Uh, excuse me, of the second episode, um, Fighting Back, 1957, 1962. We got more coming your way, so you guys um, keep working hard, stay safe, stay healthy, and oh, look forward to seeing you guys soon.
All right.